I'm going to pass it off to Mark McConaughey. Well, good afternoon on the East Coast and good morning on the West Coast. Coming to you from the ground floor of the Student Services Building here on Union Street, overlooking the mighty Jordan River on the Indiana University campus in Bloomington, Indiana. We're also coming from Austin, Texas, from Baltimore, Maryland, or as Tom Black calls it, the New Seattle, from Chicago, Illinois, Carlsbad, California, and the ACRO offices located in a brand new offices at 1108 16th Street in Washington, D.C., directly down the street from the White House, our nation's capital, for today's virtual seminar and presentation entitled Challenges and Solutions for Data Integration, a report from and discussion with the Comprehensive Learner Records Project Data Integration Work. You know, as part of the uh, ACRO NASPA Comprehensive Learner Records Project, supported by the Lumina Foundation, a work group of ACRO professionals addressed the challenges of data integration across multiple institutional data platforms. The work group met with each other and convened a larger group of potential solution providers to consider how those challenges could be met. The result of that work will be discussed here today. Our distinguished speakers today are, number one, Dr. Tom Green, ACRO Associate Executive Director, uh, Consulting and the Director of SEM. Shelby Stanfield, he's the Director of Service Innovation Networks at the National Student Clearinghouse, and he's formerly the University Registrar at the University of Texas at Austin. Tom Black, Assistant Vice Provost and University Registrar, the Johns Hopkins University, and Matt Gee, CEO of BrightHive. And serving as your moderator and one of the presenters, I'm Mark McConaughey, Associate Vice Provost and Registrar at Indiana University, and some would say the, the Brad Pitt of registrars, while other might say that I have a face made for this type of audio webinars. I leave that up to you. Um, just so you know, I also serve as the Vice President of Information Technology on the ACRO Board and as a member of the Data Integration Committee. So before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, questions, we welcome questions. We'll be happy to entertain them. Um, however, you uh, need to enter those in the chat box that's located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, at the end of the formal session, we'll be happy to entertain those questions and get right back to you. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Tom Green. Oh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, whatever time zone you may be in uh, today. Uh, thank you for joining us today on the webinar. I'm just going to very briefly go over our outline for the webinar today. Uh, in just a moment, I will talk about our CLR project and how the state integration work fits into that. Um, then uh, just a, a note there, mini poll, we, we want to make sure that we're hearing from you throughout the webinar on, on what you would like to know, what you'd like us to cover, so that we can perhaps even customize our comments to that, but more importantly, at the end of this, have a robust discussion with you. Uh, we're then going to have an overview of, of data integration by Matt, uh, and Mark will go into more detail about the work group and how we went about this. Uh, Mike Sisson, if you could advance the slide a bit, thank you. Uh, then we'll go into uh, some of the challenges that we identified through the work. Uh, Tom Black will speak to that. Uh, some of the pro potential approaches that we have uh, from Shelby. And then we've saved about the last 15 minutes here for discussion where we really want to be engaged with you. Okay, let's move ahead. So as I mentioned, I wanted to uh, frame this in, in the, process, in the uh, larger picture of this comprehensive learner records project that we've been going about. Uh, back in 2015, ACRA and NASPA uh, got together because both of our, our memberships were hearing a lot about digital student records. Um, we're hearing a lot about um, you know, uh, co-curricular records. And our members were asking us, so what should we do about these? And essentially, our answer was, well, we're not sure. They're so new and, and emerging that we don't know what we can really guide, other than to say there's a lot going on in this area. So our first round of work uh, was really to help institutions or facilitate the development of models at 12 institutions. And uh, that was very successful uh, work. And the, the 12 institutions were from all over the country, they were all different types, from community colleges to AAU research institutions, 
uh, state flagships to small private liberal arts colleges, those that worked with online students, veterans, and we had three institutions in the project who were competency-based, meaning that their programs or all of their degrees in some cases were not based upon credits and terms but based on the mastery of competency. So it was a very interesting group of institutions that developed uh, these records. And that's at the end of this webinar, you'll have a, a slide up with the project website. And we encourage you to go to the ACRO uh, website on the Comprehensive Learner Records, and you can see a lot more about what these 12 institutions did in that, in that phase of the work. Uh, that said, we also learned a lot in that first phase of the work about trying to develop these Comprehensive Learner Records. And there were a few challenges uh, to these, but probably the one that loomed large in this was the issue of data integration. Uh, and that was one that, that vexed a number of institutions who were trying to participate in this and develop their records because the very nature of these is that they are comprehensive as you know, for, by the name and that they wanted to have data and information on student learning when and where it occurred. And so that, um, that part of it meant that you couldn't just take data on students registering for courses and uh, the grades from those and have that be a learner record. It really needed to be something deeper than that that reflected what the student achieved through those courses and also what students were learning outside the classroom. And those could be in a variety of settings, student organizations, global study, internships, et cetera. So that, that problem, that issue of trying to bring uh, the data together was one that we wanted to explore more deeply as we got into now this second phase of work, uh, which is being supported by Lumina. And from that, we asked that there be a, a special part of the project devoted to exploring the issues of data integration and potential solutions, and that's how we got to this place today with this team of people, and you'll hear more about how that formed and the work that was done, et cetera, uh, throughout the webinar. But that's just the, placing this into the context. The reason that this came about was that people are trying to use more data from more sources in a meaningful way and to integrate that work. Okay, uh, Mike, would you just advance this quickly to the next uh, slide, and I'll say just a, a quick word about this. Um, so remember that in the chat box on your screen, hopefully everybody's now navigated to that, we really want to hear from you about this subject of data integration. What do you want to know? What do you want to learn today? So please type in your chat uh, comments and start now. Um, but this will also be a way that we can uh, review these. And at the end of this, we might pick a few topics or a few things uh, that we want to be able to uh, talk about. Uh, and, and uh, start a discussion. But along the way, please start typing now. When you think about data integration, what are you hoping to learn from this session today? And that will help our, our speakers be able to present uh, from that. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over now. We'll advance to the next one. And we're going to ask Matt Gee to give us an overview on data integration. Matt? Great. Thanks so much, Tom. Uh, so for this webinar, we want to have a working definition of data integration since data integration can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So for the purposes of this webinar, uh, we're going to work with this one. Data integration is a coordinated set of both technical as well as business processes uh, that are aimed at combining data from multiple sources to create new, meaningful, and valuable information. And the most important part of this definition is actually less the how of data integration, uh, that's the first part of the sentence, and much more the why of data integration. And in the context of this webinar, it's, it's really about how data integration can be used to create that comprehensive learner record and the ways that that uh, CLR can actually create meaningful, valuable information for institutions and for their students. Um, now, to talk a little bit about, about the how, Data integration's got a lot going on. Uh, usually, if you kick off a data integration um, project at your institution, uh, like a lot of the institutions that we have worked with as part of this um, CLR work group, 
they've enumerated a whole host of different efforts that have to happen as part of the larger data integration initiative. And those include just understanding what's data there, what data is there, often called data profiling, um, getting it into a place where you might be able to, uh, you know, be able to combine it, you know, cleaning it up and turning it into a structure that you can actually start to link across different sources. Being able to uh, understand not just where it is, but where it needs to go, figuring out data warehousing problems and uh, figuring out how to take old COBOL systems that both have student records and for some reason are also the uh, system of record for uh, managing payroll uh, and figuring out how to take all of those, those old systems and still make them work in the context of some new records that come together. And then actually getting the work of moving the data around ETL design and, and development all of those different technical things uh, can be part of a major data integration effort at your institution. And they can seem really daunting. They can seem uh, you know, like this huge mountain that you have to climb. Now, the good news is on the how of data integration, there are an increasing number of uh, great institutions and tools uh, and new data standards that are making the how of data integration a lot easier. This marketplace for bringing data together from a, a disparate set of sources is growing very, very rapidly. And you've got general tools that are starting to serve the education marketplace, like uh, MuleSoft and Informatica and Fulvor, uh, as well as specialized organizations like Dextera that work just you know, exclusively for institutions of higher education. Uh, and great open source projects that are solving this problem writ large, like uh, Apache NiFi. So the great news is there's an increasing uh, set of tools that are intuitive, that are helpful, as well as organizations that can help engage with your institution in solving the technical challenges of data integration. Uh, but as many of you know, the technical challenges of data integration are actually not what's hard. Uh, what makes integration, data integration so difficult, uh, <laughs> like most things in life, are the people. Uh, you have to get a bunch of different things to line up in order for a, a data integration effort to be successful. First and foremost, you have to be able to identify across the different stakeholders involved in an integration effort uh, what they all share in common for the value that they're going to see and, and bring. And those include the registrars, institutional research, student affairs, academic affairs, and other stakeholders at your institution. Identifying and having shared use case around a conference of learner record is key to making a data integration effort successful. So, uh, second, you have to get buy-in from both leadership as well as the technical staff that really own and are stewards over each of those separate data resources. And make sure that they're all on board. That cross-institutional buy-in can often be the biggest hurdle to making two data sets connect. And then lastly, even if there's willingness and there's understanding for why it's valuable, there can often be just institutional constraints, the amount of time that it takes. And often, if you're an institutional researcher that has a bunch of different required reports that need to get sent out for your institution to get accreditation or to get uh, this next big round of uh, funding from a major grant that you've received from the state, those things take priority often over a exploratory or a promising data integration effort. So figuring out how at your institution you can build and, and sometimes by that staff capacity and bandwidth is really, really critical. And those are some of the fundamental components of doing data integration well and right and getting it uh, up and running at your institution. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, hand it back over to Tom. OK, and actually, I think, uh, uh, Matt, it, it's, it's my turn. This is Mark McConaughey. Um, and actually, you know, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Green laid out the history, what happened with the initial Lumina grant, the rise and the need for the comprehensive learner record. Matt has really kind of laid out the nature of the problem. Uh, my particular job, mainly because I'm, I'm representing uh, ACRO and sort of the administrative function here, is to basically say, okay, now that we know what those pieces are, 
what are we going to do to go about trying to address specifically the data integration issue and problem? How are we going to organize ourselves? What group is going to be put together? And what deliverable are we going to come up with in order to address the specific situation? So here's, I mean, and the first thing we did was to try and name a work group. And uh, that work group is represented on the page. I'm not going to um, read it off to you. But one of the things we did try to do is represent the broad constituency that, that is uh, ACRO. In other words, it isn't just uh, Research One institutions. It also represents community colleges. It also basically represents all those institutions for whom a comprehensive learner record is of interest and of value. And we had to represent various institutions for whom uh, resources were either at their behest or for whom resources for development and for doing this kind of data integration work might become an issue. So thus, uh, uh, representing uh, that group, we hope that we've uh, tried to capture that. Now, I, I will say the group was ably led by uh, Tom Black, who's the University Registrar at Johns Hopkins and uh, Shelby Stanfield, who was at that time was the university registrar at the University of Texas at Austin. And they ably led the group. Uh, and despite their leadership, and I know I can't see you guys, uh, despite their leadership, I actually think the work group came up with a, a, a fine set of deliverables associated with it. I wish I could see you. Then I could t you, you'd know that I'm kidding. Um, so uh, to the next slide, Mike. Um, so what did we do? This was the group. Uh, the first thing we did was um, get together for uh, and, and basically organize ourselves. So the first thing we had to do is basically give ourselves a charge. And the charge was to basically identify the set of issues that correspond to trials and tribulations associated with putting together data integration. That was number one. And number two, what can we provide as guidance, as a set of issues, as a menu, or as a smorgasbord in order to provide institutions a means by which they could, they could actually bring data integration to bear on the problem they were trying to solve. So that was, that was really the overall, um, overall mission of the group. But how were we going about, how were we going to go about solving that and, and organizing ourselves to get that done? Well, really, uh, we decided to do it in two stages. The first stage, was to use the work group itself and basically to identify the primary set of issues, the primary sets of data that needed to be integrated, the primary tools that were involved, and the primary, I guess, issues or problems or challenges that each institution faced. Not only technical challenge, but what kind of cultural challenges in the individual institutions might be faced. What other kinds of things needed to be addressed in order to have a successful project where data integration was the key. So we knew we needed to do that. The second part of that is once we organized ourselves in order to accomplish those things, was to basically develop a trial balloon paper, something that um, uh, Tom Green and others refer to as a green paper. And the idea of a green paper is it becomes something that, you know, there's the old adage that it's always easier to review than create. Well, here's the creation of a paper. Let's let other people finally get their heads wrapped around the specific issue and respond to it. So that's exactly the, the approach we took. Uh, let's develop a green paper. Let's put it out to two primary constituencies uh, in order to get a fuller look at what data integration might be. The first constituency, those were those of our corporate partners, those who provide service to all of us in the higher ed space who might have very good ideas about how to approach and how to uh, accomplish data integration. That was number one. And number two, we knew that we had the tech transfer conference coming up. We knew that was a possibility to enable uh, our constituents, our colleagues, to review the, the paper itself and to provide additional input, as well as uh, potential new directions for how that might go. So that's exactly what we did. So here's what we did. If you could advance to the next slide. Um, so what we did is at that initial meeting, we all left with specific kinds of work to do. And that really meant uh, at our own institutions, uh, what was our idea of a comprehensive learner record? What were the data sources for providing that record? And what were the means by which we would go about uh, uh, including and mashing all of those pieces of information together in order to be successful? Uh, secondly, 
uh, we were to um, basically go through and identify what kind of solutions we think might be viable in the future. So we did all that. And over the course, of, and we were um, due to finish that, we had, we'd actually met in the first part of December. By the end of December, all of the members of the committee had really sent to Tom and Shelby all of those pieces of information. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, once Tom and Shelby got all of those pieces of information, uh, they basically began to mash it all together, to aggregate it appropriately, and to put it together in a readable format. And, and that's certainly what they did. That gave us time between uh, sort of the, oh, the end of January and sort of to the middle of March to sort of put together a, a usable paper, uh, and then to go back and edit it so that we knew that it was ready for um, review by other parties. The next step was to uh, have a convening of our corporate partners, all of those both, and when I say corporate partners, I mean all of those in that service space who help to serve all of us in, in the higher ed space. Nonprofits, profits, anybody we believe could help us uh, uh, address this specific situation. So we were able to put that green paper, get it into shape so that it was um, ready to be reviewed by this group, and then we had a convening in Baltimore that, that Tom Black hosted in which we, we spent the day and went over the various aspects of the paper and gathered ideas from all of those folks for how we might proceed. Based on the, the uh, input of all of that, in other words, the input we received from all the corporate partners, we modified the paper and basically made it available basically by the beginning of July for all of those in the ACRO membership. And, uh, and we sent out a, a notification to that effect, but specifically to those who might be uh, attending the Tech Transfer Conference. The idea at the Tech Transfer Conference was, one, we were going to have a session very similar to this one in which we basically presented the aspects of the paper. That was number one. And number two, we ended up having not only doing that but having a roundtable. In the roundtable, we really wanted those who were interested to give us their feedback. What did we do well? What didn't we do well? What other kinds of things should we be looking at in order to complete the, all the aspects of this paper? So if you could advance to the next slide. Um, we did that. And in fact, we received a lot of good information, particularly from uh, the roundtable. Um, um, let's see. Go ahead and advance to the next slide, Mike. There we go. The analysis from that, you know, a couple of things that truly happened. Uh, for example, somebody at the uh, conference really suggested that, you know, uh, a different space, the, the medical record space, had already tried to address these kinds of issues much before. Is there anything extensible from the platforms they've used, anything extensible from the issues they faced and how they might have put, it, put that together that we could use in the higher ed space? So various things like that that were, in fact, added to the paper. Once we did all that, there were other things that were added to the paper. We did a final review. Last but not least, we went back out to our partners, and we in essence said, Here's, this is the final version of the paper. We also want to know, as long as you don't basically put an advertisement up for your specific, uh, for your specific company, what kind of information can you add to this? So not only is this a working paper, we invited them to provide us information. It would be well-branded. You knew what you were getting. But it could be auxiliary and, and additional to the information that we were provided in the paper. And I think we've gotten a couple companies that wish to do that. You know, this is a dynamic kind of thing. We believe we're going to get um, uh, additional uh, suggestions from other companies as well, and when they do, we'll add those to the landing page upon which this, this lands. Now, it's our hope, I really hope that it would come, the uh, published paper, which will now be a white paper, will come up in a few, in a few days, if not by a week, but, it, but certainly by the middle of October. And so with that, uh, I think I'm ready for Mr. Tom Black. All right. And uh, just a quick note, everybody, I'm going to have to turn off lecture mode. So if you have joined the conference call via um, your actual phone instead of listening in to the conference normally through your computer speakers, I'm going to ask that you mute your phone right now. Um, you're about to hear a machine prompt, but it will be over shortly, and then Tom will be up. The leader has turned lecture off, and your lines have been unmuted. All right, Tom, you should be able to go now. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, 
This, yes, uh, this is uh, what constitutes, uh, if you go to slide 15, uh, constitutes the problem um, uh, slide. Um, we uh, typically don't uh, talk in terms of our problems. We talk in terms of our challenges. I'd say, first and foremost, the challenge that we face is what version of CLRs, whether it's in the form of uh, transcripts, badges, certificates, or other digital representations, will be uh, successful to meet our goals or your goals. Uh, that is, a, is generally an unanswered question at this point in time. Uh, what we basically can say is that the way we're representing learning today is not sufficient. Um, but what will be sufficient is still an open question. Now, there are additional challenges uh, associated with th this um, um, project, and um, uh, let's go through them. Um, wh whenever I look at this particular problem, um, I always uh, look at the faculty, and, and that's probably because I've been involved in uh, institutions where the faculty um, have a very strong independent voice. Um, there are you know, a variety of institutions and, and leadership can enable um, um, uh, many uh, different uh, uh, results, but in a faculty-centric institution, it can be uh, really very difficult to get faculty to join um, in, um, in, in the development of CLRs. Now, uh, why is this important? Well. Uh, whatever you're going to represent in uh, this kind of uh, uh, representation has to um, be actually assessed by some authority. And we, uh, in these uh, uh, faculty-centric organizations, we, we uh, give that authority to our faculty. So um, uh, we know that there are some faculty that are more um, uh, uh, oriented towards uh, this kind of uh, uh, re representation, and uh, I want to direct your attention to a, an op-ed that was in the Washington Post, uh, which speaks to this uh, challenge, uh, because it was uh, written by our uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, president, uh, Ron uh, uh, J. Daniels, on September 14th, and the title was please students take the impractical humanities course, it, we will all benefit. And uh, while it was not, um, off, this uh, op-ed was not offered in the context of CLRs, it does have some um, relevance, I think. Uh, in, in this op-ed, um, uh, uh, President Daniel says, uh, and I quote, as the world is transformed by artificial intelligence, machine learning, and automation, the uniquely human qualities of creativity, imagination, discernment, moral reasoning will be the ultimate coin of the realm. All these skills, as well as the ability to communicate clearly and persuasively, are honed in the humanities courses. Now, why I gave you, uh, um, offered that up is that Many of uh, the humanities and social sciences faculty are reluctant to express um, the learning that goes on in their courses in the form of skill development that has direct practical application to the, to the workplace. So uh, gaining the um, cooperation of the faculty to articulate what they're assessing in terms of skills, knowledge, and abilities is a, uh, a uh, ongoing challenge. Um, moving from there, um, finding a uh, institutional sponsor to forge ahead and 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 carry the banner of developing these much more expressive and um, descriptive um, learning um, artifacts is uh, is also uh, an important uh, consideration. Um, and then also the people that would help that champion uh, carry out a uh, development of a, a CLR are critical to the success of the development of these. And then in addition, um, since institutions uh, guard their authority uh, insofar as uh, certifying learning uh, very um, uh, closely, uh, 
we, we need to be very uh, uh, concerned about how uh, we know that a learner has achieved the knowledge, skills, and ability that we're uh, uh, validating or certifying. So a governance structure is pretty uh, uh, important to this uh, overall success of this uh, because at the end of the day, there are going to be claims made by the learner and uh, that those claims are going to be either considered either valid or invalid depending on how uh, the institution um, conducts the uh, uh, the assessment of the, those skills and then finally I would say culture is uh, is a sort of that nebulous thing that um, will either allow uh, CLRs to thrive or wither away on the vine. Um, ultimately, a culture has to have a, a, a willingness uh, to uh, create these uh, um, uh, records. Uh, there needs to be a discipline, um, a, uh, a set of routines that are repeated over and over. Um, I'm reminded of how um, transcripts are formed, uh, everything that we do uh, in an academic administration is oriented to the creation of that transcript. Um, and so it has really a, a great deal of stability within our higher ed cultures. But as you go to these alternative forms of representation, you're, you're going to find that there's going to be um, uh, a varying uh, willingness to perpetuate these uh, 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 records. And so the um, uh, uh, developing a, an organization that one has an appetite for innovation because these are uh, innovative practices uh, and a desire for continuous improvement because the, the last word is, has not been spoken on uh, CLRs, and so this is still a, a moving target, and we'll probably go through several iterations before we settle on what we think will be uh, successful for our stakeholders and our learners. And number two, of course, is uh, uh, pretty uh, obvious. Uh, resources matter, um, and when I when I say resources, I think of uh, three in particular: time, money, and freedom to act. And of course, successful projects have to have a um, healthy mix of all three in order to uh, be successful. Um, we are typically budgeted to the current activities of the day. And so trying to uh, um, de develop alternatives and, 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 and uh, reach out to our organizational stakeholders um, can be uh, a challenge. Um, and um, time uh, affordance and money uh, can also um, uh, affect um, how um, willing people are to uh, work on these projects. Um, and finally, uh, let's get to uh, the, the, the core of the problem or challenge, and that is the disposition of the data. In some places, you have too much data, in others, not enough. Um, and in, uh, in other um, cases, uh, the, the data are not in a posi uh, disposition that they're very usable. And so this can be an incredible challenge. Um, and the, the, the questions that arise when one considers um, the disposition of the data is, where are they? Who owns it? Can it be used? What is the meaning behind it? The, how is it collected? Um, if it is used and commingled with other data, does it hold the same meaning, timeliness, um, and um, will it uh, uh, stay, uh, retain the same meaning? Um, data uh, is this uh, can be a fungible uh, variable in all of uh, these uh, representations, and so uh, care and consideration about uh, what it means. Uh, um, and uh, how it can be represented will uh, matter a great deal. Um, I, I would say uh, to uh, wrap this up, uh, the problem set, which is uh, forever ongoing, is that um, uh, this is going to be a challenge for uh, some time to come. 
but I think is a worthy one and requires us to um, uh, uh, be willing to uh, continuously iterate and develop different forms um, and learn from that development uh, continuously um, in, for uh, the near future. So um, I will turn it back over to uh, Shelby uh, to uh, uh, address his area. All right, terrific. Thanks, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Shelby Stanfield, and uh, it's great to be with you this, uh, today. Uh, it's also wonderful to see the amount of interest in this effort because this is something a core group of us have been interested in for so long, and it's good to see uh, there's community interest in this as well. During the um, first phase of the project, as well as the work that the work group did, we've identified that there's a number of approaches that institutions have taken in pursuit of developing their version of the comprehensive learner record. And at the end of the day, what we've identified is that there is no right way or wrong approach. Rather, it's what works best within uh, the culture of your institution, the interest of your institution, uh, as well as what's feasible based upon your technical environment. And that the approach to data integration is really dependent heavily upon the integration and interoperability characteristics of the source systems that comprise the data that you want to assimilate as the comprehensive learner record to meet the goals for your, uh, your particular project. Mike, we can go on to the next slide here. When you look at the uh, paper, you'll see that there's an inventory of a lot of different type of information that could encompass the CLR. And these data uh, can be provided by the learner either prior to enrolling in the institution or compiled after matriculation. So what you include is really going to be depend on your overall uh, project goals. The different pieces of information uh, that may comprise the comprehensive learner record for your institution uh, may have varying degrees of authenticity depending on who provided the information and when they provided it. So whether it was information submitted as part of the pre-matriculation process provided directly from the student or whether it was provided by another institution of education that they've attended or from a trusted third party, the degree of, uh, of authenticity of the document may vary. So one consideration to take into account when you build your CLR is to preserve the context under which the information was originally provided. Go on to the next slide, Mike. So I'm going to take you through, I'm just forewarning you, a lot of highly detailed schematics, technical schematics. And this is the first one. And in this example, the information comprising the CLR may come from a variety of different uh, discrete data sources, be it your student information system, your learning management system, your student life system, or your human resources career services system, just to name a few. And again, when you take a look at the uh, green paper, you'll see that there's an inventory of a lot of different types of systems that come under discussions with respect to the CLR. And typically, the information and data are stored in separate discrete systems. So you'll need to assess and evaluate what, is, what are the integration or interoperability characteristics of each of those platforms to know how do you can then uh, access and uh, compile that, that respective information. In this particular presentation, and Mike, we can advance, I use the concept of a uh, Rubik's Cube just to kind of illustrate uh, the nature of a comprehensive learner record. Uh, through the assessment of phase one of this initiative and our discussions in phase two, a popular, popular approach to a CLR is to make use of an institutional data store, otherwise known as an enterprise data warehouse. Again, I have the warehouse here represented as a, uh, as a cube for which copies of the information from the source systems is replicated in the data warehouse. So for sake of this presentation, for illustration, we'll assume that each side of the cube represents information from a different data source, be it the academic record, an HR record, a human res uh, a uh, learning management system information, or from the student life system. So I'll go through three approaches that we saw that were fairly common through our evaluation for integration. Mike, we can advance to the next slide. Uh, one common approach uh, that was used 
was to have the data propagated to the data warehouse upon being updated into the source system. So if the technical environment in which you're operating uh, has data replication or data mirroring utilities built within it, then one possible approach is to go ahead and propagate, transfer that data upon entry into the source system, into, uh, from the source system into your uh, enterprise data warehouse. That was one approach. Another approach, we can advance the slide, uh, was to set up routine data extracts of the relevant information from the source systems to be loaded then into the data warehouse. This was actually one of the more common approaches that we've identified. Uh, and in doing so, the timing of these routine extracts may vary depending on how dynamic or static the information is in the source system. And of course, this could vary by type. So for example, information that comprises the CLR in your learning management system because that's used uh, on a daily basis, you may want to have that set up to where that data are replicated uh, several times a day. Whereas if your human resource or career services information is an element, say when a student participated in work study was part of it, you may only need to do that once per term. So the frequency and the timing in which you set up these uh, extracts and imports in your data warehouse may vary by data type. Again, part of your assessment when you look at what your project goals are, as Tom Black mentioned, the currency of the information will come into play as you start thinking about the criticality of the timing in which you extract and load that information. A third option, we go on to the next goal, uh, is that the information is retrieved from the source system uh, directly in real time upon access to the data warehouse. So, Depending on your user, your, your user experience or user interface strategies that are set up for looking at this information, and we'll look at that here uh, in a second, uh, you retrieve that information for the, uh, from the source systems in real time at, access, at the point of access. And the manner in which that information then is retrieved is really going to be dependent upon the uh, interoperability characteristics of the different platforms. So for example, there's a number of different ways in which you can integrate this data. And as Matt Gee said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, the technology exists. It's going to be other factors that really weigh in uh, on your approach to developing the CAR, uh, the CLR. So for example, some of the information may be queried using web services calls, others via XML request response mechanisms others by invoking APIs, application programming interfaces, that are written specifically for the platform on which the source system is operating. Uh, could be HTTPS calls, could be a number of different ways depending on the platforms that you're working with. We'll go on to the next slide. In recent years, uh, kind of more commonly data integration is being achieved via the use of an enterprise service bus or ESB. So as you talk, to your system architects and IT folks on campus, you'll probably hear this term ESB quite a bit. The primary capabilities of an of a ESB are to route messages between different services and applications, and then within the ESB to provide commodity functions, such as data transformation and mapping, which is going to be critical as you take data from different source systems in different formats, uh, message and event queuing and sequencing, security and exception handling, protocol conversion, and caching. So again, these are all different types of capabilities that come available within different uh, enterprise service bus uh, utilities that you'll want to see what you have available to you. And again, you may want to check with your uh, IT department or your technical staff on your campus. One issue that routinely comes up uh, in the discussions of the comprehensive learner record is the user interface or the user experience. So as you can imagine, if we start uh, compiling all this different information that could uh, go with a single learner, you can just see that there's this vast amount of, of data here. So one important factor is how are you going to present that information? So in some of our discussions, again, we stick with the concept of the Rubik's Cube. We say that the most relevant information for the purpose of at hand can be aligned or arranged together visually. And from that highlighted view, you can then provide the pieces of information that's most important for the purpose at hand. 
and provide mechanisms to drill down for additional information that may be of interest. So in this example, we've actually given the ability uh, put in the hands of a learner where the learner can target, say in this case, their engineering work that they've compiled from their academic record, their uh, engineering associations that they've had within their student life involvement, be it maybe it's a student organization that focuses on uh, engineering related activities, uh, as well as information from their work study employment. So if they worked in your College of Engineering under a work study assignment, to highlight their engineering uh, experiences and aspirations across each of those domains. And then from this launch point, you can provide capabilities to drill down into further details uh, as may be of interest. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark McConaughey for our wrap-up and Q&A. All right. Well, thanks, Shelby, and thanks to everybody for a terrific representation and what I hope is a, um, a, a good, understandable summary of the work of the group. I invite you to, um, especially as you revisit this, uh, to go out to the website, to pay attention to your notifications when the uh, final notice for the paper comes out, and uh, the additional information that will correspond to that. Um, we did have uh, some specific questions that uh, we'd like to address. One of the one of the first ones we received was from uh, the Tennessee Board of Regents. And what they were interested in is learning more about how to incorporate badging within a CLR. And Matt, if I could go to you for a response to that one. Sure. I'll just briefly mention that um, some of the really exciting work that's happening on the, the standard side with a lot of folks that um, are supporting uh, badging, uh, and especially open badges as a, as a data standard is that they've uh, been, uh, a lot of the folks have been working on um, badges in the context of uh, CLR. Uh, so for example, the uh, IMS Global um, CLR now incorporates the open badges standard uh, and they've been working on incorporating an extension of that that includes open pathways. I know um, there are uh, a variety of uh, other ways of, um, uh, of approaching that. Um, but from a data standards perspective and, and looking at uh, badges as an object that, that contains important data for students, uh, I think you, you've got most of the badging community now seeing their work uh, in, in the context of something like a comprehensive learner record, uh, which is really exciting. Um, I, hopefully uh, that uh, helps, um, and feel free to uh, follow up with a question if, if that didn't quite get it answering uh, what uh, your question was, was after. You know, I, I might add that one of the little summaries, just to just to augment some of um, Matt's discussion, one of the one of the things that we got out of the first Lumina grant when talking about the CLR, and this is a, sort of the elevator speech of them. There were really three principal types of records that uh, manifested themselves as part of the part of the grant. The first one was a co-curricular record, and I use the term loosely, but by co-curricular I mean there were academic engagements that are captured, uh, captured, recorded, and we have the ability to test them in some form or fashion to uh, a third party on, uh, for the benefit of the student. That was certainly one path that uh, several institutions went down. The second one was competency. Uh, in other words, uh, um, things that aren't organized by credit hours are now organized by competency, and how do we capture those? How do we put those in, in, not only in a form that the student understands where they are in a specific academic program, but how do we attest to that on their behalf as we send them out, either as a partial recipient of an academic award or as a full recipient? And then the third piece was um, an electronic certificate or a badge, just as a uh, um, uh, Matt was discussing, and when and when you think about that, you know, it, with the tools that we have available to us today, um, we really can render the first two as an electronic badge. So, and whether and uh, Tom always, uh, uh, Tom Black always says something about this. He, you don't like to use the word badge because sometimes it has a negative connotation to it. Um, I like to use the word e-certificate, and I think he likes to use uh, the word skill or skill stamp, he'd have, to, he'd have to chime in and say which one is exactly correct. But the idea behind that is if we can capture it in electronic pieces that are 
trends that are mobile, immutable, and verifiable. All of a sudden, we can stack those in any way we wish. That's number one. And number two, we can render them, in other words, use the hierarchies that put them together to render the co-curricular transcript, a standard academic transcript, or a competency-based transcript as we wish and as the, and as the uh, program dictates. So what I believe is that this digital badges and, you know, really awards that don't have, um, you know, we're going to have to come to grips with that. There's, there's this whole... Ungoverned, ungoverned awards and governed awards. We're so used to governed awards, we're going to have to come to grips with how to put those two pieces together. Now, you guys are at a great disadvantage. If you saw my arm movements right now, you would understand exactly what I was trying to, to say to you all. But um, I think I understand it, and the idea being, I think we need to pay great attention to badges, electronic certificates, or, or other components. Anybody want to add to that uh, before I move on to the next question? Um, not hearing anything. There was another question. Um, one was an overall question about uh, best practices of data integration, and I think I'll, I'll have Shelby uh, address that one. Um, the, you know, the other part of that question, I, I um, Asked for a little bit of explanation, and um, the the additional information associated with that is uh, asked specifically about how admissions records and registration data impacts college-wide data. And I guess I didn't truly understand what college-wide data was, and so Leslie wrote back and said, "How can the CLR?" And I think the processes associated with the CLR, how can they assist academic advising with case management and achievement of learning outcomes and goals of academic advising? And I think there's a, there's a short term, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give a real quick answer to that. One is, you know, as part of putting together a governance structure for academic engagements as opposed to academic courses, um, a lot of these uh, institutions in putting together their comprehensive learner records have also put together the foundations and infrastructure for the collection of these engagements. In other words, their identity, what governs them, what has value to them. And once you put those engagements down, then you can identify and match and collect the students that actually map into those specific engagements. As a result of that digital presence, much like the curriculum of courses, this digital presence provides a map and provides a means by which advisors then begin to see not only are the, is this academic uh, roadmap available to you, but there's also this set of academic engagements, and these are the ones that, that we attest to. You know, in addition to that, you know, as we put together courses, we always have learning outcomes. When we put together engagements, and truly if we want to have uh, value associated with them that the institutions are going to attest to, then there should be learning outcomes and meaning behind the academic engagements that we're recording. If we do that, we should incorporate the learning outcomes both in our courses and in our academic pieces, or I'm sorry, in our academic engagements. And these become data points in and of themselves that should be machine readable and encapsulated as part of the overall experience. Once you start to do that, you can then piece together for the purpose of the student the kinds of experiences, learning outcomes, and competencies they need in order to not only in, engage and be eligible for the award that we're going to present them with, but also be prepared for whatever lies for the next in their academic career. In other words, what professional skills, not only professional skills, but what what are the competencies they're leaving school with, and what can we attest to on their behalf? Not only that, and I think Tom Black would say, what do they understand that they have? Moving all the way back to that, that goes back to our fundamental problem of, okay, if we're going to engage in these activities, what are the sources of information, and how do we mash them together in an appropriate way okay so that we can both record and report on them appropriately on behalf of the student. So Shelby, can I um, ask you or impose upon you to talk about some of the best practices in addition to what you presented as, as the latter part of this uh, 
webinar. Yeah, I can try. I, I can try to touch on, and the concept of best practices is interesting because, you know, the whole concept of the CLR is in its nascent stage, and what we've seen through phase one of the grant and uh, other institutions that are doing some experimentation in this space is there's not a common approach or a common definition, but what we're starting to see are some common trends. Um, and some of these trends are uh, much of which Tom Black spoke of, but one is what's the role of faculty, given that we are an educational institution, it's the faculty governance that runs our institution, start identifying and teasing out what is their role and the information that comprise the CLR that we don't traditionally think of as being academic in nature. But being an academic institution, what is the role of faculty in representing students' uh, achievements from a human resource standpoint or from a student life standpoint, uh, obviously within a learning management system, but through all the other different avenues for which information for the learner, about the learner, is collected and managed and presented, what is that faculty role? We have it very well established and have had it established for hundreds of years on the academic side inside the classroom space. So one of the trends that we've identified through these um, uh, reviews is the teasing out of the faculty involvement in these other domains. The other trend that we see is uh, really want to support uh, experimentation and innovation to kind of tease out what's possible, but then to think uh, further about, well, what is the right thing to do, not just what you can do by compiling this information, and start setting some threshold for what the institution says is appropriate and relevant from an achievement standpoint uh, that's distinct from their academic achievement. Again, looking at uh, the academic record, those thresholds of rigor are well established and even enforced by our various accrediting agencies, but we don't necessarily have that for other elements of the CLR, again, just using uh, their HR records as an example or their student life as an example. But as institutions uh, encourage much more student involvement, student engagement, in these non-academic activities, we need to establish some type of measure or threshold of rigor that says this warrants uh, being endorsed and authenticated by the institution I'm standing behind. So I know we're running out of time, but those were just two common trends that we've identified. All right, thanks, Shelby. I, I don't see any other questions, and we are beginning to run out of time. Before letting you leave, um, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon or morning. Uh, a quick commercial reminder, there's uh, the SEM conference coming up. Uh, it's coming up from November 11th through 14th in Washington, D.C. Go to the website for more details. I'd like to say a special thanks to our technical director, Mr. Michael Sisson, and to our session producer, Mrs. Ms. Tyra Berkey. Uh, both, none of this could have happened without uh, the support of both of those folks. And with that, so long from Bloomington, uh, Baltimore, as Tom calls it, the new Seattle, Austin, Texas, California, and Washington, D.C., good afternoon.